So this morning marks week three in our sermon series on the book of James. And if you haven't been with us for the last two weeks or you are just visiting Connection Point, there are a few things we need to get caught up with this morning just so that we have a good context of what's going on. Okay, as we are studying the book of James, we have to take into account that it's not really a book. Okay, it is an epistle, which is a fancy way of saying a letter. Okay, now where other letters in scripture have specific recipients, uh, say Paul writing to the Ephesians uh, in Ephesus or the Corinthians in Corinth, James doesn't have someone specific in mind other than what is written in James 1.1, which is the 12 tribes scattered across the nations. Basically, believers who have been split among the Middle East as well as Asia Minor that are being persecuted, are on the run, are displaced from where they've come from. People didn't like the Christians that well right off the bat. Now, this is what is known as a general epistle. Not because it's basic or nondescript or unimportant, but because it was meant to be distributed to everyone. So it was supposed to be circulated to everyone in Asia Minor and in the Middle East. It wasn't supposed to just go to a certain group of people. Now we also probably said that this was probably the earliest written letter. Uh, it was circulating around somewhere between 45 and 50 A.D., it's roughly 15 to 20 years after Jesus is crucified and resurrected. We said it's heavily influenced by both Jesus' most famous sermon, something that we call the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, uh, Matthew 5 through 7, as well as heavily influenced by uh, wisdom literature, mainly the book of Proverbs, which was written by King Solomon, who's widely considered the wisest person ever to have lived. And finally, we said that James, the author was not just a follower of Jesus, but he was his half-brother. And someone who only believed that his brother was, was God after the, uh, the crucif crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. In week one on our study of the book of James, we said that trials in our lives are hard, aren't they? We said that Jesus is always there, though, helping us persevere through it. And if we follow him, we come out healthy on the other side. Amen to that? Last Sunday in week two, we said that we, how we live reveals the state of our heart and if that we have true life-changing faith, that, there, that there's fruit that's evident in us. That there is stuff that we produce as a result of Jesus coming in and renewing us and changing us. So good works, we said, come from the overflow of our faith. It's not something that we earn. In fact, we do good works not to earn our salvation, but because Jesus is changing our lives. This morning, we're entering into James chapter 3, but before we do this, I need to ask every single person in here an introspective question. Okay, I want you to look deep down, right, right inside, and this may not be as hard as I think it is. Okay, have you ever been in a place where you said something and instantly wished you could take it back like it had never been said before. All the time? Like, I'm probably sure I did it like this morning. I, I'm not sure about you. This is not that hard of a thing to pay attention to. I think that we've all been there before. We've all stuck our foot in our mouths at one time or another. So if week one was that a follower of Jesus should keep persevering, and week two is that our works are an overflow of the heart, or sorry, an overflow of our faith, then week three, what we're talking about this morning, is that our tongues have great power. Okay, our tongues have great power. They have the power to encourage and to destroy. They have the power to give life and the power to bring pain and death. But let's get into the word this morning and really, really see what Jesus has for us, Okay. Uh, starting at James chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be uh, judged more strictly. We're going to take a break there just for a second. Because there's places in Scripture where Jesus is, or uh, the writers are specifically talking about leaders. 
okay? When we talk about things like elders, we talk about things like deacons, those are for the most part specifically for leaders. And they're the chapter that we send leaders to when we want them to know what leaders look like. But there's also a lot of places in Scripture that say, for leaders, but you know what, this is a good idea for everyone. And I don't know about you, but there's not a, le- a person in existence, more so than any leader, that hasn't needed to control their tongue at one time or another. Am I right? So we get into verse 2. It says, We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect. Able to keep their whole body in check. Now, over the next few verses, James is going to give us some practical examples in the form of metaphors. And I don't know about you, but I hated, like, high school and college English. But some of us need a little bit of a refresher of what a metaphor is. Okay, we may need to figure out what these are because in all honesty, they pop up in Scripture far more than we ever think to look for them. Okay, metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase is applied to an object or action in which it is not literally applicable. Okay, that's a mouthful. Just to give you an example or two, okay, we've heard a phrase, a metaphor saying time is money, right? We've heard that one. Then this one was really funny because when I looked up examples of metaphor on Google, this is the first one that came up, and it's really weird, but it says... (laughs) He eats like a pig. I'm going to repeat that again. The first thing that popped up on Google was, he eats like a pig. (laughs) It's just kind of ridiculous. So, obviously, someone who's eating does not become swine just because they start eating, right? And here's the thing. We can't go to McDonald's and pay for a Big Mac with an hour of our lives. They just don't work like that. Now, James will be using metaphors to describe the tongue just to put a mental picture into the the readers just so that they know what's going on. They want to attach it to something so that they can look at these other things and say, that's kind of like my tongue. Okay, he lists three separate metaphors, and they are this. Bits in the horse's mouth, the rudder of a ship, and a forest fire. Beginning at verse 3, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey, we can turn the whole animal. Have you seen the size of a bit for a horse? You know what I'm talking about? It's this metal bar that goes in between a, a horse's mouth. Okay, And I've never really paid attention to them, even though I've watched tons of westerns, and there's always tons of horses in those. But we never think about the things controlling the horses, right? The bits attached to two straps of leather that the rider holds in the attempt to steer the horse in the direction that they want to go. They are small, but they are powerful. So in 2014, Danielle and I go up to Portland, Oregon, and we go up to visit my grandparents who are in hospice. We know that they are short for this world. And we go up there, and we know that we can only visit them for an hour or two at a time because they just don't have any strength. And so we've got to figure out ways to occupy ourselves for all the other times and the times that we can't go see them. So one of those days, my aunt comes in because she lives, she and my uncle live very, very near to them and said, why don't you come out to the stable where I board my horse? I have a friend that will let us borrow their horse and both of you can ride it. Anyone who knows me that knows automatically that it is a mistake with the words ride and horse in the same sentence together. That just seems ridiculous. Okay. It was not a good plan, but here's the thing. Danielle had experience as a kid riding. She was great. We have pictures where she's actually standing on a horse like this on top of the saddle, and it's crazy. But here's the thing. I have zero experience whatsoever. Okay, I'm sure I went to a petting zoo or like a a county fair or something like that and rode uh, like a pony. But let's be honest, that's sitting on a horse, it's not riding a horse, right? So we get there, and we have been slightly briefed on how to control this massive animal. I get up, it is a very, very large horse. I have very, very stubby legs. So it was a big horse. I climb up, and I am not what you would consider a natural by any, way, any means whatsoever. And for those of you that have never been on a horse, and I'm vastly oversimplifying this, okay? 
the bit is attached to the reins so that the rider can control them. When you pull back on these reins, the horse is supposed to slow down or stop. Okay? Likewise, with your legs, if you are squeezing or kicking the horse, the horse is supposed to go faster. Okay, that is basic horse riding. <laughs> so I start slowly squeezing the horse, and it starts going. Okay, but here's the thing, is I, I don't know what to expect, so I'm starting to ride the horse, and since I feel like I'm starting to fall off, I start squeezing the horse harder. <laughs> okay, so the horse is now going faster. As the horse is going faster, the only thing I can think of is, pull back to stop the horse. So the entire time, I am pulling back on the horse and kicking him at the same time, and the horse is very, very confused. So here's the thing, is Danielle is doing completely fine. She's starting to go around barrels and galloping and going faster. It's ridiculous. And in the midst of this, the horse just finally decides, I'm tired of this. I'm not going to listen to you anymore. So the horse goes over to the fence and starts trying to scrape me off on it. <laughs> Finally, I just decide to get off of the horse. I step down. The horse is happy. I'm safe. Everyone's good after that point. But here's the thing. The bit's supposed to control the, uh, control the horse to go in the direction the rider wants it to go. But just like me confusing the horse, there's times where what we meant to say and how we say it changes the interaction and the direction of how we talk to our friends, our family, our coworkers, those we come into contact with. Like as a result of misunderstanding of that, we get misunderstandings, right? We have annoyances, we have confusion, we have pain. People don't always respond in the way that we think that they are going to, correct? People can be hurt by the things that we say, no matter how small, no matter how joking, and no matter what good intentions that we have. Horses aren't supposed to be ridden around by untrained riders. Horses are at the best when the rider confidently knows what they are doing, and likewise, when we are able to control our tongues, we show a maturity growing inside of us. And we have a new freedom to speak into the lives of others because they know that in any situation, we can speak in a mature and a healthy way. Picking up back in verse 4, it says, Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. He refers to the rudder of a ship controlling the boat. And if the, if, like the bit of a horse was all about control, the rudder of a ship was all about direction. So I know that we have motors now that steer boats and they steer them in directions, but it, those motors are still small in comparison of, the, of how the boat goes. And with our tongues, sometimes we can steer people in the right way and sometimes we can steer them in the wrong, right? So even with giant cruise ships, the rudder is still incredibly small, even though it might be the size of a four-story building in comparison to the rest of the ship. It's all about direction. But then we get to this word, likewise. Okay, likewise is important. It's almost like a therefore situation for Tim, okay? Okay. Likewise, meaning also or similarly to, likewise the tongue is small compared to the rest of the body, but it makes great boasts. Great boasts. What are, we even, what are we even talking about when we say that? Well, here's the thing. The Greek for that is originally something of arrogance, okay? Or basically someone that props themselves up whether they can follow through or not. So even though it's small, our tongues can show our arrogance. They can show our pride. As I said, and pride can steer people in the completely wrong direction. The third thing that he likens uh, the tongue to, it's very, very practical to me, okay? I have a very, very easy mental picture to it. First five, uh, five, yeah. Verse 5b says, Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. 
It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. James does not appear to have a very positive interpretation of what the tongue looks like, does he? So being from California, most of you know that I'm from there. Uh, We moved here about four years ago. But being from California, it is a half joke almost every year from about August to October or December to say, well, it's time for half the state to light on fire again. And even though it's not a very funny joke, it's a very practical one. Because here's the thing. I've seen the damage done, and I've walked through the middle of a road with haze, almost sitting like a blanket just sitting there. So during 2020, uh, during the wildfire season out there, 9,917 fires broke out over the case of the state and lit almost 4.5 million acres on fire. Okay, the worst of them was this August complex fire. It was this huge one, which had been the first one ever to be described as a gigafire. Okay, it's that big. It was a gigafire, burning a million acres just from this one fire, okay? And depending on what website you were looking at, it's widely considered in the top three worst fires in United States history. Okay, it started with 37 different lightning bolts just shooting down, catching things on fire, and then it went... And just came in and and just started burning. And in week two, we'd hear 4% of the fire is contained. Or week five, we'd hear 8% of the fire is contained. Or week four, we'd still hear 60% of the fire is contained. When I look that up, I have no practical concept of how much, what that actually looks like, how big that actually is. I legitimately can't tell you how big. We don't have a mental picture of how big that is, okay? Here's the thing. I have a perception issue, so I legitimately can't tell you how far it is from where I'm standing to the back of the sanctuary. I can guess it's not going to be a very good one. But here's the thing. The August uh, County fires, or the August Complex fires, was about the same size as the state of Rhode Island. That's how much was burned. If Rhode Island was there, Rhode Island would no longer be a state because of how much the fire happened. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? So in case you have trouble visually seeing what this would look like in your head, these are a few actual images from week two of the fire. Randy, put those up for me. This is week two. It just kept burning. In fact, I was talking to my dad about it earlier this week, and he said that they went on a trip. They drove, and as they were getting up, they just came to a wall of fire, and that the concrete was black because it had just melted and wasn't even, even smooth anymore. I think one of the things people most remember or they think of when they think of California is the Golden Gate Bridge. Randy, can you pop that up there real quick? <clears throat> we have this picture of this with the water glistening around it and everything like that. It's, it's majestic. It's cool to walk over. It's awesome. But here's the thing. For four months, it looked like these. It was a haze, and you couldn't even see the skyline. The fires destroyed over 10,000 structures, cost $12 billion in damage. And here's the thing, just as easily as a lightning bolt can cause that much damage, James warns that the tongue has the exact same power. Things that said aren't easily forgotten, they destroy, they consume. Here's the thing, words can stick with someone for a lifetime and can, can contribute to how a person sees themselves for the rest of their life. Hassani Pettiford, he's a marriage speaker, uh, and he's a counselor, helps us understand this really, really well when he says this, our communication can get us in trouble at, the to- at times. You've heard it said, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never harm you, but it is a lie. He says this, sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will kill you. Words cannot do what sticks and stones cannot. In fact, the Bible, he just says the Bible, but I'm listing it as Proverbs 18.21, says that the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. This means that you can speak life into your life, or you can speak death into your life. In the very same way, 
You can speak life into your relationships or you can speak death into your relationships. That can be hard to hear, isn't it? We can speak life into people or we can speak death into people. And unfortunately, I think we speak a whole lot more death than we speak a whole lot more life into people. I think we're quick to kill quicker than we are to encourage. Have you ever said something because you were in such a bad place that you've just visibly seen your children crumble? Because I'm ashamed to say that I have. Maybe you've been on the opposite receiving of that where the words that someone else said made you feel like you don't belong or that you can't do anything right. I've been there too. Our words can kill and destroy and bring life to those around us. From these metaphors... We can find control or lack thereof, direction or lack thereof, and destruction or life. But in all honesty, I think James is trying to tell us something that we already deep down know. That our tongues aren't the sole parts of our body full of sin. They're not the thing controlling or making us say bad things or hurtful or disrespectful things, right? The tongue doesn't have a mind of its own. It comes from a deeper place. And I believe that every single time that Jesus taught or he interacted with the religious elite or people came to him, it had everything to do with the heart every single time. So when he talked about lust, it wasn't just about our eyes. Our eyeballs weren't the problem. It was our hearts. We talked about money and giving. It wasn't that money was evil. Money is just pieces of paper. It was all about our hearts. When we serve others, it's about our hearts. When we pray, it's about our hearts. How we treat our enemies, that's the, one of the hardest of all. And you guessed it, it's all about our hearts. So every aspect of our relationship with Jesus and every aspect of our relationship with every human who has existed is about where our heart is. So there's a story of a demon-possessed man who gets brought to Jesus in Matthew chapter 12. And the Pharisees, those that are the religious teachers, those that should be following God the best because of how much training and how much religion that they had in them were the farthest away from God. And they accuse him of using demonic spirits to cast out more demonic spirits out of this guy. Which to me just doesn't make sense, and even Jesus says that. You can't cast out demons with demons, but you can cast out demons with Jesus. And Jesus rejects this, and he turns the focus back on the Pharisees and says, you brood of vipers, that's a harsh thing to say, I'm scared of snakes, so that doesn't sit well with me. Okay? He says, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Maybe you've heard it in a different way. A different translation says it this way. Out of the overflow of our hearts, the mouth speaks. So here's the thing I want us to remember this morning, okay? It's all about the heart, and I think we have a divided one. In fact, I know we have a divided one. What do I mean when I say a divided heart? Okay, I mean that we are conflicted with where our loyalties lie spiritually, and it is a constant, eternal, internal battle. It is forever, and it's always inside of us. We will not be 100% perfect until Jesus comes back and remakes us. Until then, we are always towing the line between the evil inside of us as a result of sin and the good that Jesus has come to save us with. So we're not 100% good and we're not 100% evil. We carry both. There are times when we move towards Jesus and there's times where we move towards the world. And James talks about this really, really well when we pick back up in verse 9. He says this, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. 
Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? No. My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear frigs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water, period. Here's the thing. He likens this to a fig tree, an olive tree, and a grapevine. They are the three most important things in Israel at the time and in the, in the time of Jesus. They are um, the economic values. They are things that are used for healing. They are used things that are used for consuming and eating. But none of them can produce one of the others if it's, that's not what it's supposed to be. So you can't draw figs from an olive branch. You can't draw grapes from a, from a fig tree. You can do any number of those different combinations and still they don't add up. So with the tongue, we can praise God and with it, we can curse those that were created in God's image. Our mouths reflect our divided hearts. It's how people who claim to love Jesus can also be incredibly racist and hateful. The divided heart is how someone who says that they follow Jesus can bring condemnation or threats of violence on politicians, the mentally ill, those living with addictions, those that experience homelessness. We react differently to people from different nations, those of different religious or generally anyone that disagrees with our beliefs or viewpoints of the world that we live in. Think about that. Our divided hearts say that we can disagree with anybody for anyone, or for anything. But that's not how it should be. It can even play out as believers hating other brothers and sisters over the stupidest of things. Somebody got sprinkled or somebody got dunked, it's not enough to hate somebody over. Okay, we use a, a, a massive loaf of French bread or we use a, a, a little thing that tastes like cardboard, it does not matter. It's not worth hating a brother or sister over. The divided heart praises God and yet curses the Imago Dei in other human beings. You guys remember Pastor Tim last week spoke about the Imago Dei? Here's the thing. The Imago Dei is Latin for the image of God. Now in the beginning, God created man and woman and said that they were very good. It is the only thing in creation that God said was very good. Okay, here's the thing. A hamburger, it's good. Another human being, very good. Even with evil rooted inside of us. The image of God isn't me saying I have God's ears because that's ridiculous. But it is saying it is the symbolic representation of the connection between God and man. And no other creation in existence has that with God. We can see that we have a divided heart because there is something wrong when we speak praises to God but then curse his creation that he finds beautiful. These two things were never supposed to be able to coexist at the same time. So we cannot say that we love God in one sentence and talk about how much we hate or despise another human being in the next sentence. There's a lot wrong with our hearts, church. But I think that when Jesus came down to start to restore, even though it's a process, that's what he does. Things start to change in us as we start to follow him. So I want to give us two kind of practical things that I want us to look at that we can put into practice this week. Okay, we can put it into practice today if we want to, okay? So this is what we do with this message. Number one, we regularly need to ask God for we regularly need to ask God to change our hearts to be more like his. When our hearts begin to change, we start to react to God and others in a completely different way. But sometimes we've been begging God for a while and just saying, God, change our heart and everything, but it doesn't feel like it. Maybe because we want God to change our hearts that look a little bit like him, but not totally. 
Maybe we say, God, will you change this in me, but leave this stuff alone? Doesn't work like that. God gets to change all of us, or we're still not giving everything over to him. Here's the thing. Maybe if just asking him to change our hearts isn't working, maybe we just need to figure out a change of perspective. Okay, maybe we've been praying for years to change our heart about what our, looks, uh, our work staff and, and coworkers look like. Maybe instead of praying, God, we, I don't want them in my life, how, how does this keep working? Maybe we get to say, God, they're made in your image. What do I need to know about them so that they can see you? Maybe there's that person that constantly, constantly annoys you or is up in your face or something like that. Then in all actuality, we just need to say, God, why are the, what's the reason that that is happening so that maybe I can minister and help them heal? We don't look at situations like that very often, do we? We need to change our hearts to look more like God's. Number two, we regularly need to examine our hearts to see if there's something we need to repent from. Because here's the thing, unknown and known sin, unknown and unconfessed sin, can shape the way we act and speak. It's known, okay? Here's the thing with sin. There's two types of sin that we can look at, okay? There is the eternal sin, as in we were all born with sin DNA rooted inside our, our spirits, okay? And that, Jesus needed to come, die on a cross, resurrect, and be able to take care of for us. So that we could have any hope of being able to talk to the Father again. So that's one, that's the big overarching version of sin, okay? But there's also that what we can call the everyday sin. And here's the thing, if we wake up in the morning hating someone or with a bad attitude or that nothing in life is going well, then the rest of our days are going to stay that way. Probably until we talk to Jesus about it. Just like the smoke that came from the forest fires, sometimes we are blinded by the destruction that's caused around us. But here's the thing, that when our hearts are clear, it stops looking like the second pictures of the Golden Gate and starts to begin looking like the first again. When our hearts are clear, we can begin to see what God wants for us to do in the kingdom more clearly. But that means we need to turn things over to him on a very, very regular basis. So if last week we said that the way that we live reveals the state of our hearts, then today we piggyback off of that and say this, bottom line, what we say and how we say it reveals the state of our hearts. I'm going to invite the band back up as, as we're getting ready for this, but I'm going to repeat that one more time, okay? What we say and how we say it reveals the state of our hearts. I don't know about you, but I regularly need to keep reflecting because if Jesus isn't changing me, I'm a jerk. I need to keep reflecting and I need to keep having my perspective changed because if not, the people that are supposed to hear about Jesus don't see Jesus in me. They see why they don't want Jesus. So here's the thing. Hey, when we look at changing our hearts or we look at confessing sin, none of those can happen if we don't know Jesus to begin with. So this morning, maybe you need to hear that there is a God that absolutely loves you, that there is a God that wants a relationship with you, and a God that wants to change you for the better, not just in behavior, but in soul. Wants to change your heart to be more like his. His.